welcome to the Postmodern Art Podcast, the podcast dedicated to giving artists who are wowing the world over the platform they deserve. I am your host, Nathan Raglan, and for today's episode, I just gotta say T-G-L-A-L-I-B, which stands for Thank God Left at London is Back. For today's episode, I brought back the wonderful Left at London, a indie pop artist whose debut album, T-I-A-P-F-Y-H, wild audiences last year, and whose newest EP, Transgender Street Legend Volume 3, should be dropping the day after this episode premieres, June 24th. That was a sensational guest that I was so proud to have last time I had on in episode 3 of the podcast, I must emphasize, which, by the way, link to that episode will be down below. Watch with caution is very cringy, but nevertheless, it was incredible to have Nat back and be able to talk about music and influences and history and all stuff like that. It, it's a great conversation that I was so grateful to have, and I sincerely hope you guys enjoy it as much, if not more. And make sure if you do enjoy Nat and want to hear more from her, make sure you check out the links down below, especially her music. Trust me, it is absolutely sensational if you have not listened to it already. If you enjoy the podcast, make sure you like, share, subscribe, or follow whatever audio streaming platform you prefer. Leave five stars wherever you can. I see that stuff. I love it. If you want to go even further with that support, or at the very least have a place to where you can talk about all these incredible artists, all the incredible art pieces out there, and just have a way to grow as a community, maybe you should consider joining the Postmodern Art Podcast Artist Sanctuary Discord server. There you can connect with other artists, maybe even former guests as well. Get to connect. We can have fun events like movie nights and Jackbox and all that stuff. It'll be so much fun. Link to that Discord server will be in the description below. And of course, you can always support the podcast on Patreon, just like Jacob Raglan does, at patreon.com slash PMAP. But now, without further ado, please enjoy the Postmodern Art Podcast. I went back and recently watched it again to make sure I didn't, like, ask questions again that I did last time. I yeah. I, I freaking cringed at how I was asking questions. Because <laughs> you can probably attest to this whenever you, like, make music or whatnot. But, like, do you ever listen to some of your stuff and realize you weren't as confident and as developed as you are, like, along the way or whatnot and realize the changes or whatnot that you've made with your process? Uh, no, totally not. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, that's right. You've been flawless every single time. I apologize. Who am I thinking <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I get that feeling every time that somebody brings up Revolution Lover to me, to be honest. Oh, I'm really? Like, oh, that one. That one. <laughs> cool. I mean, it's still a good song. I'm just, you know, I can understand where yeah. you're coming from on that one. <laughs> yeah. And also, I want to say, like, as much as I did cringe listening back to that episode, I have to say thank you so much for that episode on so many different yeah. levels. <laughs> yeah. Because it's one of those, like, not only, like, for you, whenever I first had you on, you were one of, the, like, the first big guests that I would consider or whatnot. Like, I, I had looked up to you and, like, really did admire your art and such, and to, like, have you on, like, was mind-blowing to me. Plus, I've had a ton of guests, like, bring up the fact that you've been on the podcast, which is, I thought was really cool. <laughs> nice. I, what, what guests? Uh, okay. There's actually a couple. Um, one of them is someone I think I mentioned to you about, um, Silva Hound, who is this, uh, like EDM artist or whatnot. So that was one, as a matter of fact, he straight up told me, he's like, Hey, you know, if you can get the opportunity to, to talk to Nat and be like, Hey, I'd, like he wants to produce with you at some point. If, if you're down for something like that, <laughs> literally just tell him like, if he has a beat in mind, just send it to me. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll send the message to him and I'll see what, see what we can make happen. Um, <laughs> I was going to, yeah, I mean, no guarantees, but like, I, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing what people have in mind for what my vocals can fit on. Yeah, know? exactly. And then also like, you know, obviously a couple of the musical guests that you're kind of in a similar circle with. So like uh moon rabbit, a Smith, like, you know, those like that, you know, yeah. uh, holiday kiss obvi- or Robin, obviously, you know, yeah. um, very much, which once again, thank you for recommending me her EP because it was absolutely outstanding. <laughs> it's it's great shit. I, I she, still, she, she's so underrated. It's, it's criminal. I, I listen I listen to that all the time and the single that they released not too long afterwards, uh, something. Oh my god, yeah. I fucking love it. <laughs> 
so good. And also, like, was it like even just this past weekend? Uh, I guess that I had on the podcast uh, a VTuber by the name of Tag the Otter. He's like, oh my god, I love her music like so much. Like, let her know that I. Love <laughs> so like it's oh man, it's cool. It, it's it's I, long and the short of it. Once again, thank you for being on here the first time, and thank you for coming back. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Oh, also, one last thing. <laughs> no, another yeah. little side discussion or whatnot. I tried to take your advice recently whenever I listened back to the podcast. I tried to listen to a little bit of Coldplay, because I remember whenever I asked the, the icebreaker last time about unpopular opinions or whatnot, you said that like Coldplay is like instrumental and people should give them more respect. I tried listening. Vita La Vida specifically. I, need Vita to, La Vida. I didn't get to Vita La Vida just yet, but I did listen to Parachutes. And Parachutes, I fucked with it. Like It's good. I get, I get that vibe. I get that fucking vibe. Viva La Vida was uh, the album was produced by uh, Brian Eno, as far as I'm, as as far as I know. Okay. So that like that album's like just fucking legendary. It's it's got like their biggest range. Like there's some songs on it that are just like huge, <laughs> just fucking huge. It's it's and, my goal uh, this week to to get a chance to get around to finally listening to it because that's I, I know yeah. I, I'm aware of like some of the big hits that obviously came off of it, but obviously a band is more than just their big hits. So. Yeah, like Violet Hill alone is just like, like that song deserved to be the hit off that album, to be honest. Okay, okay. So good. I'll be so sure good. to definitely keep that in mind. All right, Nat, before we really get going, I want to ask more or less the icebreaker question of the podcast. Let's say yes. you get an opportunity to go to a deserted island on your own accord. It is just you alone with your thoughts. You get to kick back, relax, breathe, and just get to enjoy yourself just for a little bit, you know? Um, okay. To help make sure you don't go completely insane on this island, you get to bring one piece of media or one piece of art with you to help with kind of the, the relaxing going on. If given this opportunity, what would that one piece be? Well, considering that it's one piece of media, uh, I think that I would eventually go crazy. How long am I on this deserted island? <laughs> As long as you want to be, and I'm also going to say I'm very loose whenever I say one piece. Like, if you want to bring, like, you know, say a season of something or, like, a, a collection of albums of something or whatnot, I'll allow it. Don't worry. Just... <laughs> okay. Hmm. <sighs> That's hard. I feel like, um... I feel like, um, if I say, like... God, what the fuck? I, I see. I have I have my answer for this question when somebody asked me if I could only have one food on a deserted island. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a. Yeah, I never think of asking that question because yeah, you know, our podcast. Yeah, but as far as media goes, I would probably say, oh God. I, 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 I will tentatively say, um, I will tentatively say, oh man, it's too tentative. I'm not sure if I could say it <laughs> because, because when anybody ever asks me this type of question, I'm always like, this is going to happen to me one day. Like I am going to be deserted on an island and I'm going to just happen to have this piece of media with me. Okay. And it's going to suck no matter what I choose. <laughs> uh, and so I really like, I really want to choose something that's like, cause you say one piece of media does, right. does a span, does it, does an era of albums count? An era of albums absolutely count. I was going to say, I know I had a guest recently say that they would bring the, uh, like the Steve Perry era of journey, like music as their one piece. So I will allow that era, uh, an era, if you will, to help with that. Uh, okay. Then in that case, I'm going to say, okay, I got it. Okay. Instead of what I was going to say, I'm going to say this. Every single song that, like, like I would have a compilation of every single song Frank Ocean has had writing credits on. Oh, okay. Because the thing about it was that I was trying to think of who, like, whose discography I really, really like and mm -hmm. really think has a lot of replay value. A lot of replay value. And I was thinking, my first thought was Death Grips, but you can't bring that on a deserted island. You would go nuts. Um, <laughs> Fair. 
Then I was thinking Frank Ocean. And then I was like, maybe not Frank Ocean, maybe somebody else. Uh, and then I was thinking Mac Miller's last four albums. Oh, uh, okay. That, like, like from Good AM to Divine Feminine to Swimming to Circles. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic run of records. Absolutely. And, and then I was like, ah, but, like, it's maybe not. And then I went back to Frank Ocean. I was like, yeah, Frank Ocean. Because the thing is, you can have songs like, that, like you have you can have songs that you can relax to you have songs that you can like really think to and then you have slide which that song alone <laughs> will will get me through whatever fucking shit i need to get through that that's a song that's a song that puts me in a mood every single time it plays like that summer that came out i thought that was the best song of that summer <laughs> yeah it, it was that it was the best song of that summer and the next two summers <laughs> like like genuinely it was just vibes a plenty i think it's one of my most played songs besides money machine okay that's um, on my itunes library um yeah <laughs> and i'm not including my own discography oh wait hold on maybe if i say my own discography because <laughs> at least i'll be like i can remember that i made this <laughs> I know that it's like on my own accord and like, you know, I will eventually leave as opposed to being stranded on it. But, right. You know, right. Like I said, like this is know. just for you to just like kick back and relax and like, especially the Frank ocean pick that you had right there. Like there's a lot of ranges and a lot of different moods that can rock like a different experience on that Island, no matter how long you're on there. I mean, yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I, so I, okay. Yeah. Final answer, Frank ocean, That's final right. answer, Frank ocean. You're locking that in. That is what you're going to stick with. Okay. Yes, because that way I can have, um, I can have, um, like, I can have Endless, I can have Blonde, but I can also have some random Justin Bieber and Beyonce songs. <laughs> I can have a couple of Kanye songs. I can yeah. have New Slaves. You could have that New end- Slaves. <laughs> I, well, out of context, that sentence sounds pretty bad. It sounds very uh, bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> ixnay on that one. Uh, but... But um, overall, my point being, I would have a very solid collection of songs. I would have a very solid playlist. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I would. I would have uh, Frank's track and not the original Wolves, which is funny to me. <laughs> so if I ever was in the mood to listen to Wolves, I would have to like just imagine it. <laughs> you would just have to imagine how it originally was with Frank's track in yeah. there, something like that. <laughs> yeah. There you yeah, go. because the because. Uh, there was a version of that song that played at the Madison Square Garden gig that was uh, without Sia and Vic Mensa, and instead it had just Frank Ocean on it. Right. I think the only reason that those are two separate tracks now is because of like label shit. I think that's like what I guess that it would be, but I wouldn't be. Either way, I would case. have Frank's track. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't complain with any of Frank's track in general. So I think that is a good selection. Yeah. And if I do say so, I think it is a great way to kick off. The Postmodern Art Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am your host, Nathan Ragland. Uh, feel free to subscribe or follow whatever audio streaming platform you prefer. You can support the podcast on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash PMAP. And follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at PostModArtPod for future updates and guest announcements, including today's guest. <clears throat> She is an indie pop artist whose debut album, T-I-A-P-F-Y-H, wowed audiences, including yours truly. Her newest EP, Transgender Street Legend Volume 3, comes out June 24th. Welcome back to the podcast. The transgender street legend herself left at London. Yay. (laughs) How are you doing today? I'm doing really good, actually. I've been doing a lot of stuff uh, just around the house and, and... reading and talking and i don't know it's been a productive day thus far good. I'm, I'm pretty happy with my day thus far well good i'm happy to hear that i'm happy that it's you know nice good and productive and hopefully if this isn't productive it's at least good um yes. <laughs> but nevertheless yeah i've already showered you with a bit of it before but it was wonderful to have you on the podcast and the first time on episode three Nevertheless, I think with this episode, it's going to be 83 to give you an idea how long it's been. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's been a while, <laughs> but oh, fuck. I know I feel old just saying that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but 
nevertheless, like it's an honor to have you back here. And I know whenever I was listening to it last time, there were some questions I forgot to ask last time. Probably because I was nervous as all get out. Not going to lie. But yes. <laughs> but to, to have you here, I can finally ask some interesting questions, starting with more or less the origin stories of Nat Puff. I know I asked about Left at London last time, at least the name of it, but I didn't ask about yeah. the origin stories of Nat Puff. What got you interested in art and music in the first place? Um, I'd say a lot of it was like, I, I've, I've, I've told some interviewers this, but like legit, I'm pretty sure if I look back on it, one of the main reasons I wanted to do music was to meet girls. Okay. I'm like legit, I'm legit convinced that my like sixth grade self was trying to be a player. <laughs> uh, and then like, you know, of course, like I developed a genuine love for music and whatnot because like, you know, my, my father was uh was very um was it was very like involved in music he he wasn't like <laughs> like I, i'm worried if i say that people are gonna be like oh industry plant no <laughs> like no what happened was literally my dad like um my dad like worked on scores for um for like uh l- like people would send him compositional scores for a full orchestra or something like that and he would just arrange okay. it in sibelius or finale or what musical notation uh service what what have you and uh then he would send it back to the composer and then like sometimes he would print it out fun fact a lot of uh movie and video game soundtracks are recorded in bastier university which is in kenmore washington really beautiful chapel it's got it's it's like a it's like a it's i, I think it's a i think it's like a like a like like a like a catholic university so okay. like there's like a huge there's a huge chapel like within it and that's where all of like that's where a lot of stuff was recorded i actually uh did uncredited work on uh <laughs> so 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 i did uncredited work on the dungeons and drag the first dungeons and dragons community episode um what because my dad uh, my dad wanted me to know a little bit about the business, and so I was like, "Can I please work on a uh, community with you?" And he was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna have to pay you under the table though, because otherwise that's child labor." Like, cool. <laughs> uh, so I was able to um, I was able to watch clips of that episode without any dialogue. Oh wow! Uh, before the episode was released, and it was really interesting, like trying to debate with myself, like whether or not I should should be able to watch this if I wanted to figure <laughs> out what happens in the episode. And it's especially funny because that the scene, the 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 scene where um, Hector the well endowed has uh, sex with the the woman at the stable, mm-hmm. um, they they didn't have sound in the studio. Uh, for the dialogue, and so I assumed that dialogue was going to be replaced with it, but I never got that satisfaction because of the because in the regular episode, like they they censor all that out and just have it all like be just soundtrack, and so I never got to figure out what um what what they were uh, doing until you know I mean of course I mean of course it's very implied what they're doing, but it's like I never knew the specifics, you know? Right. Uh, and it was it was a damn shame. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that was. That was pretty much my origin story with music is that like, you know, my dad, one of the first uh, albums that he ever uh, gave me was Close to the Edge by Yes. And that remains one of my favorite albums of all time. OK. Uh, and it's like not even due to nostalgia. I I can listen to that with zero nostalgia and be like, this is one of the best produced, best written, best soundscaped albums that I can think of. The fact that there's so much happening in terms of like 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 instrumental work in in tone Mm -hmm. in like 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 engineering wise it is a fucking juggernaut of an of an album and it impresses me every time listening to it and and being like this was made in this like the early 70s this predates (laughs) this predates like uh fly like an eagle which sounds worse like uh (laughs) Like if you compare the two, it's like the synth work on fucking close to the edge is just like, oh my god. Okay. <laughs> uh, the fuck the fucking little like, like that like plays like near the beginning, incredible. It's it's one of those things where it's like, the first three minutes are kind of confusing uh, to like or to like you know they, they were kind of confusing to somebody as young as me, 
And then like, you know, after that moment, like everything clicked, everything fucking clicked. And uh, I still consider it like one of, if not my favorite album of all time. Um, and so like, I remember the first album that I ever bought myself with my own money was uh, I went to Target with my dad and and uh, I ended up picking out a Jimi Hendrix Greatest Hits CD. Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, considering that Jimi Hendrix is like Seattle icon, you know, it felt a little <laughs> like... Uh, <laughs> I, I it, it was really funny because uh, I remember I was like trying to decide between two albums. Okay. The first one was the Jimi Hendrix album, and the second album was uh van halen's greatest hits okay i think about what would happen if i chose van halen's greatest hits instead like here and there i think i would have been a completely different person yeah i think i, I, I might have been kind of an asshole <laughs> like uh, <laughs> like i i don't know what type of music i would be making but i think i would play the drums instead because i originally wanted to play drums okay i i wanted to be a drummer at first and then my dad was like, you should probably learn piano first. And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I learned piano, forgot everything about piano, learned <laughs> guitar. And then, um, and then now we're here. Yeah, now um, we're here. <laughs> it's also funny because in terms of origin stories, uh, the only reason that I started producing was because that Logic Pro X had a really good selection of, um, of built-in amps. Mm -hmm. Or no, Logic Pro 9 was the first one that I had and it had a really good collection of like amps that you could just plug into your computer and you know do like that so I had like uh, an Apogee Geo which is like a floor pedal okay that uh worked with Logic Pro 9 that also doubles as a guitar interface a guitar specific interface mm -hmm. and um you know like um like I recently upgraded to a focus rate, which is so funny to me that I recently updated to a focus rate because that's like normally people's first one. But no, I was <laughs> I was I was even further in the trenches. I did not have an XLR. I had a I had a fucking USB mic. Uh, uh... So like I recorded all of Tiapfa with um with a with a Blue Yeti Pro. Okay. Uh, uh... Which people I remember people when I told people about that they were very surprised that it ended up sounding like, you know, as good as it did, which is very funny to me. I, I, uh, just the idea that like, you know, but yeah, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say like, I, I think when it comes to that, I mean, blue 80 kind of has that kind of reputation of being like everyone's first microphone when they, you know, do yeah. stuff or whatnot. And you know, they think it's always better, but like it, it, toying around with some stuff here and there, like you can produce some incredible stuff. I think, you know, TF or it's a perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because, uh, like, like the Blue Yeti Pro did have an XLR out because that it was supposed to be the Blue Yeti Pro as opposed to just the Blue Yeti. Right. Um, and so I never used the XLR out because <laughs> I didn't have an XLR interface. Okay. I just was like, I was just like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to use this. <laughs> I mean, it, it, if I do say so, I think it worked fairly well. Plus, I was going to say, when it comes yeah. to USB microphones, I mean, I'm using a USB mic right now, so I I, yeah. I get that. I get that. Um. <laughs> I also used a USB mic for uh, a different – I used the Rock Band USB mic for oh. – um, for, um, uh, My Eyes Are Going Anyway, the Purple Heart EP version. Okay. Um, the, the part where I'm like, do, 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 do. That part was just me putting my mouth over a um, a rock band USB microphone and just distorting the shit out of it and just trying to do like some Kanye vocoder shit over it, <laughs> like literally. It's amazing. It like, it's amazing the stuff you can do with ingenuity. <laughs> it was it was like one of the first like producer moments I think that I ever had where I was just like, what if I did this and. Uh, <laughs> it ended up working out fuck done, so I was really happy that it worked out. There we go. Um, do you yeah. do you remember when for you it went from just like a general love that you kind of had for like music and such to a passion and wanting to make it your career? I mean, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of sort of like when, um, 
I feel like okay, this is gonna sound like a tangent, but I swear to God, it has relevance. You know, you know the you know the show Breaking Bad. Yes, I am aware of it. <laughs> okay, so you know how like there's like a lot of like fan like like fans saying like this was the moment Walter White became Heisenberg. This was the moment. Like it was this. No, it was this. You know, et cetera, et cetera. The truth is that like it was such a gradual change that I really feel like you know like. Like the first time that I ever did a remix, okay, that wasn't just a mashup. Was probably the first moment that I really felt like I could do something with that. Okay, um, and that was a nightcore remix of "Father Stretch My Hands" uh, by Kanye West that I added like um, a bunch of like stuff to, and I put it on uh, my my uh, amateur remix album. Uh, you wouldn't download a car. I still have um, that album. <laughs> it's it's it, it's it's got some fun tracks on there i, oh, yeah. I still listen to the, i still listen to the gaga remix sometimes i just love that it sounds like cake by the ocean yeah it, uh, do- it does it-, <laughs> it does it straight up does um and uh you know just like like that was like the first moment that i was like oh i can do stuff more than mashups and then i'm pretty sure that like during the you are not alone enough original sessions i was like oh these demos are good enough that i can release them uh as as evidenced by the fact that you are not alone enough is still not released uh they weren't but (laughs) it's the confidence really yeah yeah i mean confidence certainly has has taken you places if i do say so myself just kind of your online presence and how you kind of uh how you kind of like present yourself out there more or less because that's one of the things that i that's one of the things i admire about you more than anything else like you just have like no hesitation you're gonna put the stuff out there people are gonna enjoy it and they're going you know they're either going to enjoy it or they're not going to bother, but you're just going to push the stuff that you want out there more than anything else. I really do try to make things that I like primarily. Um, and I, you know, there have been times where I've tried to, you know, either settle or like sacrifice what I believe to be uh, better for my art. Like, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of I, I read some reviews of Tiafa on Rate Your Music because mm-hmm. I'm an idiot, <laughs> and um, and there were a lot of people that were like, "Oh, the mixing's bad," and I'm like, "Okay, cool. So what do they dislike about the mixing? It's kind of distorted. It's kind of like it kind of clips here and there. I'm gonna do that more. <laughs> so yes. like you know like like um like I I've been I I've I've said time and time and again my favorite fucking plugin that I use on almost every single project now mm-hmm. is uh, is called Toop. It's by Good Hertz. Okay. And it's a, ta- it's a tube amp and a tape distortion all in one. Okay. And it also has an EQ built in. And if you fuck with the EQ, it can really make some interesting fucking sounds. I, I, like, um, I, I really like what, uh, what type of sounds that it makes. And even putting it on the master and just like turning up the bass so that everything is kind of like clipping is really is really really fun for me um and so like that's like the the primary um the primary like thing that i'll recommend to people is uh is tube okay because it's it's just really fun to experiment with and like explore stuff with i can and it's also not that like it's also like not that like overwhelming of a plugin i feel like some of these plugins have like too many plugins within the plugin (laughs) uh (laughs) And will just absolutely confuse me, but oop, not at all. It's just like three things. I was gonna say it's, it's it's like trying to download like a video game. You have to like get this DLC. You have to get this plug in to go with it. You have to get like you know some like yeah. aim system or something like that. Like I just want to play a game about like a dog walking the street or something like that. Like come on. Yeah. No, precisely. Like that's like like the, the more doohickeys that you add to your plugin, the less likely that I'm going to end up using it. I don't care. <laughs> If I want reverb, I'll just get a reverb plugin attached to the thing. Like I don't need to. I don't need a reverb in my vocoder attached. Like, like, like no, no, I don't no. need that. I don't need that. <laughs> That's like vocoders already like do a good bit when it comes to echo and distortion alone. Like if you want to add more with it, you're gonna do that on your own accord. <laughs> Well, it's like vocoders take up enough of the fucking CPU that, like, yeah. like, I don't need I don't need any more CPU to be drained. 
If I want reverb, I'll add reverb. Thank you, you very much. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, speaking of distortion and, you know, reviews and more or less like, you know, your debut album more or less, that's something I definitely want to touch upon and I definitely want to go as a lot in depth with it. For those that do not know, uh, you've released your debut album last year. In fact, at the time we were recording, it was just over a year ago today. Um, TIA. No, literally a year today. Yes. A year today. Goodness. <laughs> it, yeah. I swear it does not feel like a year. I swear it only came out like a couple months ago. Like, cause I, <laughs> it feels like that. Like, I know that it was released like bef right before my birthday. I know that it was a summer album. But it feels much newer than that. And the thing, like, about, like, you know, what I've been working on, because I've been working on more shit than just, like, TSW3. Right. I, I've, been working, I've been working on this third album, and um, and I've been trying to, like... Uh, like, I, I literally started work on a third album, like, for this run, um, for this era, um, like, in September. And I'm, like, nearly finished with it. And, hey. it's, and it's just like it expands on a lot of the sonic stuff uh, that I was adding to my sound in Tiatfa, but it has almost like it, it 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 like almost it's almost like Tiatfa minus TSLV one. Does that make okay. any sense? Now that I think about it, thinking of how, how those two sound sonically, I get where you're coming from. I get yeah. That. Okay. So that, so that's that's the third album. It's just like like you know, distorted poppy shit. That's like <laughs> clean and dirty at the same time. That's what I'm really trying to do. Ooh, I, I love the way you describe that clean and dirty like that. Ooh. Cause I can think of like, especially with, uh, Tiapfa, you know, there were some yeah. beats in there. There were some songs in there that were like clean and dirty all the way around. I definitely want to touch on a good bunch of them, but yeah. I, I want to know more or less how the album even came to be in the first place. Because if I remember correctly, wasn't this base like the the foundation of this album? Is, didn't you get like a grant or something along the lines of that to be able to to work on an album like in a isolated place or something like that? Yeah. So what happened was, um, so here's the timeline. Okay. I was hanging out at my house one day and I was really um, I was really depressed and so I was told to go on a walk and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a walk around the neighborhood and I just started taking pictures of fucking everything mm -hmm. and. Um, one of the things that I took a picture of was the house that ended up being on the cover. Okay. And, um, in that house, it was actually the back of the house. It wasn't the front of the house. Um, and, um, and it just was so, it was just such a haunting picture to me that I literally posted on like, on like, uh, some private account of mine, like, like I'm going to make this an album cover one day. I know it. <laughs> and, um, then a couple months later, um, I like, like I had to find new place, like almost immediately. Um, and, um, and I called my mom and she offered for me to live with her. I ended up not taking her up on the offer, but either way, the, phrase that she said was there's a place for you here and i remember literally in the middle of the phone call writing that down and um or no she said that there's always a place for you here and then it like kind of shifted throughout like the months and um i wrote that down i i i never considered the two to be combined until a certain point where i was um i was making pills and good advice that was the first track that I made. Okay. That like, actually, okay. There's there's a technicality <laughs> there. But, um, that was the so that was the first that was like one of the first uh, tracks that I made for the album. I made it to audition for uh, this uh, residency program. Okay. Where where um, Shoreline Washington's art program was holding like a residency for. Like, you stay on this beach house, like, you stay at this beach house, and you just make a piece of art. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to try to do that. I I pitched, uh, I pitched, uh, I pitched, like, four unreleased tracks to them. Okay. Not as a, not as a, this is what the album's going to be like, but, like, this is what I'm capable of. The first one was uh, Pills and Good Advice. Okay. 
The second one was I'm Not Laughing Anymore, the first track of Volume 3. Ooh, okay. The third one was Black and White. Oh, um, okay. But, uh, but it was like the full album version at that time. Right. Uh, which I've since I've since remixed and it sounds a lot better, but okay. the fourth one was uh the fourth one was uh, the last track of TSLV three. Um uh, which is called Will My Altars Go to Heaven? Uh, and I sent that to him, and um, and uh, you know, he he eventually said that it was like, like like uh, a great audition. I asked him if I could put pills and a device on the album. He said yes. I'm talking about David Francis here, mm-hmm. um, who kind of ran that program. And, um, and when I was coming up with a track list for, uh, for Tiafa, like, I remember, I remember, so first of all, the reason why it's called the acronym as opposed to just there's a place for you here, uh, was because that somebody, I, I started tweeting out the acronym, uh, as a way to get people to guess what it is and build right. a pipe. And somebody suggested something that was so good this is a protest for your heart that I was literally like, I've got to fucking use this as a title. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and so I just like, didn't settle on either. And so I just made uh, one track be called, there's a place for you here. And another one called this is a protest for your heart mm-hmm. and put them both on the album. And I figured that, you know, the way that the album is laid out, it ended up working out perfectly. Um, Pills and device was finished by the time that I started doing the, um, doing the residency the ballad of marion zion check was written for a completely different album but um i ended up scrapping that album and putting um ballad of marion i ended up finishing the ballad of marion zion check specifically for this album okay and then um there's a place for you here was um conceptualized entirely um at the residency uh, although i reused a chorus from an earlier uh fr- from an earlier beat that uh, got scrapped okay um and then it could be better oh out of my mind was entirely conceptualized there the reason that the title is out of my mind was because of that sample at the beginning okay um um because i was like i gotta have i gotta have an intro and i gotta have something in the intro and so i was just like all right i i found this old uh tape of my dad's band um uh the sorcerer's apprentice (laughs) what it was called um and uh really fun tape to listen to it was so fucking shocking to to me when i was like in high school like like thinking that my straight edge dad who played wood and woodwinds uh in this in this prog band you know uh hearing the lead singer of of this band playing in this tavern going like this next song's about breasts and i'm like (laughs) what (laughs) and and like um, out of my mind um, was kind of born from another sample of that same thing. They actually did have a song called "Out of My Mind." Okay. And uh, and I didn't even listen to the rest of the song. I just literally like took that sample, edited it to make sense within the like like soundscape that I was trying to go for, mm-hmm. and it worked out perfectly. Um, then uh it could be better was originally a song that i was going to do with more kismet which is why uh they have a writing credit okay um but uh like they made the beat i made the entire rest of the song uh pretty much up until the uh up until the the reefer madness sample i wrote that entire thing to this to this more kismet beat and then uh they hit me up and were like, I don't actually like this beat anymore. Uh, and I was like, could I still like use this melody? And right. uh, they were like, yeah, of course. And, um, Kudzu, uh, was, was, uh, conceptualized entirely at the shoreline art residency. And the final track, this is a protest for your heart. I only had the part before the drop, Okay. But I had that for like months and months and months and months and months. I was originally going to try to make it a wow. Okay. Song, but, okay. Um, but eventually I was just like, I, I, I want to release this myself. And, uh, that's how it worked. That's how yeah. that entire album was pretty much conceptualized. That is wonderful to hear. And like, especially knowing more or less that you had this like opportunity to really like 
get it done and get it out there and whatnot. Like I was, it was incredible. I remember whenever you were first producing it, I remember like an email or a link that you had, I think it was like on your Twitter asking for like different samples or so, or things for like yeah. inspiration, I guess more or less. And I thought it was always cool that you wanted to have like the community involvement, like, you know, usual more than anything else. But like, even then, like, especially listening to the final product that you produced out there, like, Oh God, now nah, I'm not lying. That's like at least a top three album for me right there. Like straight up. Thank you. <laughs> like I, 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 I'm, I'm really happy that you fuck with it. Cause it's like, um, cause it's like those samples, um, which are like sprinkled throughout the album and make up, uh, pretty much all the footage on pills and good advice mm-hmm. lyric video. Um, like, like it was all because of the community that was sort of attached. And I, I was, I wasn't originally going to do that. Um, like I didn't want to have the, to hassle, I didn't want to have the hassle, but then, uh, David Francis was like, uh, we want you to like, like, we really like the stuff that you're making, but we kind of want to make it like a little bit more focused. Like what, like what, what is this album going to be about? How does it involve the community, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, oh, I can just make it involve the community by having these samples in. <laughs> and uh, then I asked for samples and then a bunch of people gave. So yeah. Asking you shower really scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, pills and good advice. I'm pretty sure is the only song that doesn't have a sample um, from oh, wow. that. Cause it was, cause it was finished prior. Okay. Yeah. Marion right, Zion. Right. Yeah. Marion Zion check has got the, um, has got the um whole like outro with the with the forest the nature sounds yes um um i'm pretty sure that there's some purring sound effects in the in like the intro of there's a place for you here because that song was about my cat no um and um it could be better the main like that plucky that plucky sound that is a vocoded guitar playing an E string. Okay. Um, Thank you for answering that because I thought for the longest time it was a sample from what was it? The, the sober EP from childish Gambino or whatnot. Like the, one of this. Yeah. I, that's what um, I thought. But I, I think I saw you like message it on Twitter at some point. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember some people being like, Oh, is this retro by childish retro? Gambino? There you go. <laughs> I couldn't clear that fucking sample. No, <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, but no, it was literally a vocoded uh, guitar, and it sounded so fucking cool that I just was like, "All right, cool, I'll keep this." Mm-hmm. And then um, there's also it was also that beat was entirely based around a sample that is literally so buried in the mix you can't really hear it, but it Ooh. was literally a, somebody shaking a pill bottle full of estradiol, Ooh, and okay. um, and I just like you know quantized it and turned it the fuck down, and it it sits in the mix quite nicely. Okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then let's see what there, there, there's some samples that I'm missing here. I know it, but, um, like, like, I don't remember if there's any samples in out of my mind, uh, that are like, that are like from, from other people. Um, but, um, I do know that, um, like, um, Oh, same with kudzu. I'm not sure if there's any samples in kudzu. I can't think of any. Uh, well, I was um, to say from the community, no. But didn't you use the same uh, like drum beat that uh, the Igor also used as well? Igor's theme also used. No, uh, no? that was actually that was actually a drum loop that uh, I think I got that preceded Igor. Um, that's, yeah, that's what I was saying. From, like, didn't um, it sample the same one or something like that? Or no, 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 no. no, no, no. Okay, it, it sampled it sampled a friend of mine, uh, Nick Villamazar. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his last name. I've never asked him, but uh, either way, he sent me like the reason that we're friends was literally he just sent me a guitar, like no, not a guitar. But he sent me like like a pack of like really good drum loops. And okay. The same the same drum loop pack that actually inspired Choke because that one of those drum loops was right. just what Choke was uh, entirely built around. Um, but um, but like. Like yeah, so I had that in the Willie Crook sample, but like no nothing from the community as far as I know. Okay. But, uh, I I do remember this is a protest for your heart. Not only having a fire crackle from somebody, but it also had um, that like oh my god, it's recording like that sample. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was literally like, I am so glad that whoever submitted that left that in the folder because it's literally like, it was literally like a folder of like, twelve or. 20 like usable 
clips and then just that clip alongside of it. And I'm pretty sure that's the only one I used. Yeah. Like weird shit happens but you know it's a good punctuation point more than anything else for the entire album because like my goodness <laughs> you used it well um yeah <laughs> i i, I want to just like talk about like a good couple of the tracks because like we talked about it a good couple of times but pills of good advice it is bold of you to start an album off with a 10 minute song that is basically a musical journey but once again i was along for every single second of it my god <laughs> It's funny that you mention Pills and Good Advice's length specifically being a bold thing to start an album with because the thing about that, I've gotten some crit- uh, some critiques about um, starting the album with the most ambitious song and then having it like kind of like dip down after that. And I don't see it that way. I, th- I think of it more as like a thematic sort of thing. I feel right. like, yes, I feel, I feel like, I feel like the, um, I feel like if you're looking at pills and good advice as the intro to an album that gets progressively like less interesting, that's n- like, I mean like fair, but that's not the fucking point. It's like the same. It's like, it's like if uh, somebody was like really mad at like the intro monologue of Romeo and Juliet for spoiling the rest of the play. Right. Like, no, this serves a purpose here. Exactly. This is trying to get you involved in the story. It's trying and, to like, get you, you know, in that like mindset of like the mentality of yourself or at least the artist for what the rest of the yeah. album is. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, if you don't fuck with it, that's fine. But like, also you're wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like that, that's, that's, that's basically all I can really say about that. I mean, you know, I'm not going to even argue uh, on any point when it comes to that, because you're right. I mean, obviously like this is your album. How can I argue? Yeah. With any point of that? <laughs> but, yeah. but nevertheless, like it's, it's still like, I say it's interesting that it's a 10 minute, but like I said, like, it's not just like a 10 minute song with like the same beat. Like I said, for me, it feels like a fucking journey with all the different, like, you know, uh, rhythms that you use, all the different like songs and and uh, like it feels like I'm listening to like an entire journey once again over and over again. Like, was that always kind of the mentality you wanted to have with pills and good advice, or was that something that just kind of snowballed more and more the more you tinkered with it? I had an ex friend uh, who I was going to make a collab album with, okay. and I kept on saying I really want to make a seven minute song. Uh, to her and she was like no people don't want to listen to a seven minute song and i was like then we make them listen to a seven minute song like <laughs> like what do you wh- why why be why be a negative nancy over this like uh and eventually i tried doing a set i tried starting a seven minute long song but like we were literally like like i literally didn't have my computer on me so i literally well i didn't have my regular computer on me so i had to use my laptop and try to produce it on garage band which did not work I, I um, imagine. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then I just kept having that idea of having a seven minute long song in the back of my mind until it turned into a 10 minute long song in the back of my mind. Just like, this would be a good challenge for me. And, um, and, uh, you know, I had essentially, I had essentially that intro, the acoustic intro and the instrumental for up until uh the i need a sign and i'll be fine section Mm. and i had sat on that for months until i was like i want to finish this because i also because that was another song that was going to be a wow okay song i sent it to robin and robin was like this is really cool and um then eventually they were like like actually i think this is more your song i could i couldn't add anything to this and i'm like okay suit yourself okay and then eventually you know 10 minutes later like um (laughs) like um that was when i started adding more and more shit to it i remember the biggest the hardest transition was um was figuring out um how to get from the um the like and if you fight for me then how do we proceed to um to the do you understand section that was blank for the longest time oh my god um like the like 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 the like i remember being like i think at one point i was like i'm gonna try trap drums over this and see what i can do and it didn't work so i just like you know added some random like vintage break 
put on a shit ton of effects and then i was like hey dad uh can you put a saxophone solo on this and this was when my dad was uh was still like going through like like cancer treatments and whatnot and he you know like my mom my mom said that apparently when i asked him that he just perked right up and he like he didn't have to do this but he bought like a bunch of equipment just to record (laughs) this one solo like he literally bought like 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 a bunch of fucking equipment just so that he could properly record this i was like you can record this with an iphone i don't care and he literally like refused (laughs) and just like bought like a solid state like interface right just for like saxophones and got a saxophone mic and everything um and uh you know like um I'm pretty sure that that was the uh, the last thing that he ever recorded, um, like the last music that he ever recorded um, before he passed. Um, and just like knowing that I was able to collaborate with my dad, because I have a, I have a song that's unreleased that I always wanted my dad on. I won't be able to get him on that one, but now that I at least have a collaboration with him that is out. I really feel like, you know, like I, I really feel satisfied with uh, that. And he also told me that like during a lot of like the rough parts of um, of uh, recovery that he like actually, you know, really listened a lot to uh, that album and uh, it really helped him through a lot of it, which is an absolutely incredible um, thing to hear from your own father. Um, like you know especially considering that like you know my dad like and i say this i say this very nicely my dad was very critical of my music not like not like not like belittling or anything like that mm-hmm. but he would actively be like he would actively give me like mixing notes if i showed him stuff okay and um and he would give me suggestions for like ways to arrange certain songs and stuff like that so he was he was like very like he was very um, politely critical about my music and this album was, I think the first thing that he was like, yeah, I don't have any notes on it. <laughs> uh, he just, he just liked the damn thing. And yeah. um, it was, a, it was, it was a, it was a really, really uh, like, like um, it was kind of, it was kind of like, um, it was like a powerful humbling experience to just be like told that by by your father uh that like you know your album has like helped him through uh the last like the last year of his life um it's just it's it's strange but it's um it's really really powerful to me i i I hold that with uh the utmost um with, with the with the um i don't know i just i i i hold that with a lot of pride and a lot of like gratefulness. I I can I can understand where you're coming from. Uh, it, it I can only like obviously I'm not a musician myself, but I can only understand yeah. like putting time and effort into something for so long and having that kind of you know I guess respect at the end of the day when yeah. it comes to that kind of stuff. Plus I, I I'm saying this jokingly. I imagine there's probably a little bit of nepotism. Cause in fact that he's on the album, that's probably, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that bastard. <laughs> that rat bastard. That being said, his little saxophone yes. solo that or his solo that I heard or whatnot in the album, like yeah. in that little gap you talk about fucking hell, that's a good punctuation point. Uh, uh, again, like it fucking rocks. I, I, I love that little like, transition to your that little part that you were talking about when it comes to pills. oh yeah like it, he certainly added a lot to that mix he added a lot to that mix and the first thing that he sent me was actually uh i showed him the in progress with like the silent gap in the middle mm-hmm. and um and the first thing that he sent me back was um just to test out the audio he sent me audio of him playing um playing the uh like the start to climb and then I get a little higher uh, section. Like you can hear him in the background of that section playing saxophone. Cause I was like, this is, this is good. I'm going to yeah. add it to the song. And uh, I remember being first being like a little confused. Cause I was like, yo, I asked you to do a solo. You just like didn't even do the right section. And then I was like, <laughs> wait, hold on a section. Hold on a second. 
you, you actually did this uh, not only uh, you, you not only are intending to do this correctly, you added something to the track. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, okay. I'm 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 put this in and be grateful and uh, call it good. There you and, go. Uh, and I think that the saxophone coming in near the end, especially considering that, like, you know, there's barely any repetition in that song. There's only three parts that really repeat. The fact that there's a saxophone that comes in later is one of those things. The only other things are the uh, I've been texting on the freeway section mm-hmm. and the um, and the intro matching the outro. Um, but all in all, I really think that because of the gap between the second uh, texting on the freeway section and the outro i think the saxophone really ties in like okay yeah this is this is this is these are the motifs of this song and um really just tied the thing together so i i'm I'm really happy with that song uh for obvious reasons but uh, i i i'm I'm very proud to be able to say that like that's my dad on saxophone uh in that track because I, i i I don't know, like me and my dad, you know, like we've had moments uh, in our dynamic where, you know, like, like, you know, classic teenager hating their dad and shit, like, you know, like stuff like that, like that has happened. And I feel like if I told, um, I I feel like if I told um, teenage me, you know, like, like, you know, we reconciled and now he's on one of your favorite songs of yours. Like, I think that younger me would have been surprised, Uh, (laughs) but like, it's a, it's a, it's a welcome surprise and it's a, and it's, um, and I don't know. I just, I, 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 I've really been like, like in terms of like having hope for, people to heal for the sake of themselves and others i really looked to looked up to my dad um for you know what he for everything that he did to uh you know make up for the moments that you know did make me uh worry about our dynamic and he he really he really stepped up and became like the best dad that i could have asked for and uh and that's um and i i know you're gonna ask about this uh later on in the interview but i i feel like since we're talking about it so much i feel like i should mention it go for it uh the the first single of tslv3 which is coming out on the 17th it's probably going to be out by the time this episode is out yeah yes yes because i i Um, I wanted to release this like the day before uh tsf or yes three came out so yeah so um so the single make you proud uh i wrote that immediately after finding out my dad had cancer and um i sat on it for the longest time trying to get trying to figure out what to do for the intro Mm -hmm. i had a friend in mind uh he ended up not being able to do it um and then you know after like you know doing this and doing that um t-y-g-k-o uh told me um you know some stuff about like his uh growing up experience and uh and his family and i was like you might be the perfect person for this uh for this track and he approached it with a lot of respect and a lot of um and a lot of attention and really really made it feel like not his track not my track but our track and um and even more so like their track Mm -hmm. uh like this is not just for us this is also for the families that like you know we have been raised by right and um so i was very i was very i was very happy to hear his uh his interpretation and um and it ended up being like uh like that song ended up being uh one of the songs that my like one of the last songs that my dad listened to um before he passed he was in hospice and um listened to that song and his wedding song back to back and his wedding song was like an original written by my uncle okay um so so it's not like something that you can stream or something like that (laughs) but like um but like no he 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 really the fact that like that song stayed with him 
through the entire like it, it it evolved essentially throughout the entire process of him trying to recover and and just the fact that I was able like like it feels like even though that it was totally my will to write that song it feels like a privilege and an honor to be able to write that song and right. it feels it, it feels very powerful to be able to write that song and it feels especially powerful to know how that song's timeline corresponds to my father's uh my father's cancer diagnosis and um knowing that like you know i my voice was one of the last things that he heard um before he passed um just um it's something that i cannot take for granted and i remember listening to this song for the first time in a while because like you know emotions were kind of like tense and high because we knew that this was going to be my dad's last days right uh i remember getting the call from my mom uh that you know your dad has passed and uh i i i drove over to uh see him one last time mm -hmm. and i put on the song in the car and i felt this like like i felt i i i like shivered for a second and then i felt like this like warm presence and um and then I just started crying because, like, I I knew that that was like you know like like my dad's way of saying goodbye after he'd passed, and um, and that song was just playing in the background, and it was a very intense emotional moment, and um, so I <laughs> I always worry about like all right if I do these if I if I start doing like these like live performances again how the fuck am i gonna perform this without just like you know break like it down it. yeah <laughs> yeah i i like 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 you know like uh like kanye was performing hey mom the grammys like i i want to avoid that moment i want to avoid that moment for myself but you know i i i, I am i am proud of the song that i am worried about my emotional reaction to it so yeah, I don't know. Fair. Maybe maybe I'll 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 reach a point of uh like you know, grief like like grief acceptance where I'm able to perform it without like feeling too emotional, um but still feeling like I can like you know perform it with the emotions that it is necessary to perform that song with. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. basically that's basically the first single. <laughs> um, yeah. That's basically it. Yeah. I was gonna say. Uh when it comes to this that whole entire thing firstly i know you know i i, I want to say first and foremost i i god how am i gonna come up from this jesus christ oh uh, <laughs> no okay first of all uh i if i hadn't said it before i i'm sorry for what you know hearing with your dad or whatnot and i can only imagine the just based on what little you've told me or whatnot kind of the interesting and amazing life that was probably unique that no one else could I, I can't imagine anyone else having that amazing experience that he may have had while well, you know it, the, the way that it was and ended or whatnot it, it's I, I sincerely like I, my thoughts are obviously with you and your family and such and if nothing else like knowing kind of the influence that he has had on you knowing the knowing knowing the journey that you and him had been on, you know, throughout your entire life or yeah. whatnot and knowing how it was, it's great to know that if nothing else, he was a good foundation for the music that you have made, the music that you are making and the music going forward. And I know that you will be wearing your heart on your sleeve when it comes to stuff like that. And I think he, if he wasn't already, he's certainly going to be proud knowing that, you know, it's always going to be a, a major part one way or another. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's it's really funny because that I feel like you know the um the relationship between a father and a daughter like you know there's always going to be like um there's always going to be like you know a little bit of like teenage spite 
that like the daughter will have regardless of what the situation is and i right. and i remember like you know talking about like how he would give me mixing notes and stuff like that i never used any of those mixing notes <laughs> i like i never regarded any of those mixing notes as anything that i would want to do to my songs and i think he knew that and i think that really like like i don't know the idea that i was able to like like show my dad my art and be like this is my art it sounds like this on purpose and then to hear him go like what if it sounded like not like that on purpose and then me just going like nah and then like he would just be like okay like it was it was it was it was such a it was such a such a um just like like i i think about this conversation that we had once where i showed i i bought the entire almost the entire white stripes discography on okay. cd okay and I lent it to him because, um, because like, you know, my dad, like, you know, grew up like listening to a lot of these like rock bands and White Stripes were like one of the last great rock bands of, um, of, of my generation at least. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I showed it to him and he was talking about how, like, because we had also had just happened to watch uh, the documentary that Jack White's in, It Might Get Loud, um, okay. around that same time. And he was talking about how, based on the way that the music sounds and based on that documentary, he really respected Jack White for being able to, quote unquote, fight the music. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, he specifically would play crappy guitars that, like, made his fingers bleed with a drummer that like you know was notoriously out of time and it was it, it sounded exactly how it needed to sound like like meg white is a fantastic stylistic drummer jack white is a fantastic guitarist and and songwriter and the idea like the idea that like my dad could like listen to that and be like oh it's like he's fighting the music really actually influenced how i like approached songwriting after that moment okay. because that a lot of my a lot of my music was me trying to make peace with something and then you know that really introduced like that that kind of opened the floodgates to be like i could i can fight my music and that's why some of this shit sounds distorted. That's why, that's why, like, um, like, like the drums on Kudzu, like when the first verse comes in, that's why they're so grimy and almost out of, out of time. <laughs> um, like, it's all intention. It's all like me trying to fight the music and this, like, and like the shit that I'm working on now really 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 adheres to that philosophy of trying to fight one's music uh one's own music and um i really i really really am like I, I really really hold that conversation that i had with him like in high regard because i had never heard him describe music like that and uh he he the fact that he would humor listening to my modern day bullshit bands <laughs> uh you know really really meant a lot to me and um i think he had a lot of respect for what my opinions were on music and uh even to a certain extent politics which is not something that you normally expect from a father and daughter combo yeah no, not uh, really <laughs> yeah i mean like he voted republican most of his life hmm. uh and uh he voted for he voted for gary johnson in 2016 because he couldn't bring himself to vote for trump and uh, so I was like, oh, thank God. Like, that was like a huge <laughs> weight off my shoulders. Uh, but, like, the thing is, we would constantly debate each other, like, in the car rides that we would take. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, like, a hostile thing. It was just, like, we were just talking politics. Like, like we were pundits or something like that. We right. didn't, like, like, like it, it felt like... Um, it felt like even, the, even if the things that we were talking about had a lot at stake... Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like the conversation was going to make or break our dynamic. It was just part of it. And so I, I was just really happy to like, you know, talk like I, I was really happy to debate and like discuss things with him no matter what it was really. And like, that's, that's one thing I'm going to definitely miss about him. Um, 
just like the conversations that we would have when we really got into a conversation. Right. right. I feel like the last, I feel like the last conversation that we really had was like, you know, about like uh, New Orleans funerals and like how, like how those funerals sort of perceive death. And considering that like none of us knew that my dad was going to die, but like my dad, like, like I, I felt at that moment, like maybe my dad knows something that none of us do. Right. And, um, and uh, we're trying, we're trying to get, um, we're trying to get like a, like a jazz band that can perform some like, like upbeat New Orleans style music for that exact reason, because that was like one of the last conversations that we really had. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been smooth sailing uh, in terms of trying to find uh, a jazz band. Cause you know, he, he was also a session musician, uh, okay. like for, for like some, for some local jazz artists. He played. He played the saxophone. He played, I think, the clarinet, and the piccolo and the flute. Um, he was primarily involved in woodwinds, but uh, saxophone was like the brass instrument that he could play, and okay. he could really play it. Um, great guy. Absolutely. Great guy. Absolutely. Yeah. I can trust me. Like I said before, I heard again. I've heard pills and good advice. I know he can play a good woodwind if given the opportunity. Uh, <laughs> play a damn good saxophone there you go yeah um i i feel like if i didn't correct that there would be somebody in the comments being like oh actually it's uh it's it's brass and not woodwinds <laughs> and I, that, I, I i just had to mention that real quick i'll say if that person's in the comments i would simply say thank you for watching the video i sincerely hope you enjoyed um <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for getting this far and uh hearing all of that stuff about my father and then concluding with Oh, uh, actually, this guy got something wrong. <laughs> I, I like, I like, I like the type of uh, hateful person that, uh, that like that specific type of hateful person to be like. I'm gonna listen to this very like emotionally charged, uh, like interview, and then I'm going to critique it uh, just because they got one thing kind of wrong. <laughs> It's I, funny. To me at I was gonna, I'll say. I mean, most people are the same way when it comes to albums and such. So I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> but I'm was, gonna sprinkle. I'm gonna sprinkle this. Uh, the rest of this interview with factual inaccuracies and see what people say. <laughs> well, let's start with a factual inaccuracy or a potential factual accuracy with the other, with one of the other songs on uh, TF Club that I wanted to talk about, and that is the Ballad of Marion Zionchik. Um, if I thought the first one was bold, this song was right up there. Um, how did you first hear about Marion and what? made you decide i'm going to make a song about him uh so i had this idea for an album uh called called the puget sound which was going to be a sufjan stevens-esque look at washington state mm -hmm. and you know the same way that he did with illinois and uh what was the other one that he did didn't he one on georgia or I, something like that or something like that but like either way Oh, th there's the first, uh, there's the first uh, factual inaccuracy comment we're gonna get. <laughs> it was actually Alaska, and the fact you don't know that really means that you shouldn't be here. If it's uh, actually Alaska, but... I'll be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's that many facts about Alaska, but anyways, um, there. So, so like I, th the first thing that I did after I conceptualized that was like I'm gonna look up fun facts about Washington. Because, like, I knew some parts of the history and I knew some, like, locations, but I wanted to, like, you know, jog my memory because it was, like, mid-quarantine at this point, like, right. mid-severe quarantine. And so I Googled fun facts about Washington. I clicked on the first article I saw. The first fact was about a hotel in Seattle that is supposedly haunted by Marion Zionchek. Oh, I didn't know about this. And this and this caused me to go down a rabbit hole where I was researching more and more about Marion Zionchek until I was like calling the UW libraries and being like, Hey, do you have any like thing any like factual information about Marion Zionchek? And because it was quarantine, they couldn't even open. So um so uh, like a lot of my research was limited to what was available online. And a lot of my research was specifically because uh, one guy, uh, let me find this guy's name. Um, <laughs> uh, it was all because uh, Jeff Stevens 
uh, did a bunch of research that, like, you know, I was a bunch of the research that I was going to do on Mary and Zion check. Pretty much everything before the he married a woman he knew for a week section was all because of Jeff. Okay. Um, I I emailed him a couple times and he was like, yeah, this is all the information that I have. Use it however you will. And, um, that, and you know, that now we're here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, um, I remember scrapping the album after I wrote, after I finished writing the Ballad of Mary and Zion check because that I knew that I wouldn't be able to top it. Uh, <laughs> And then I was like, well, where do I put this? And then that was when I like really settled on scrapping that project and going and putting it on uh, the album. So I just thought it fit thematically and it works. Uh, the fact that, you know, it goes straight from like a 10 minute, like prog pop anthem to just like a piano ballad. It feels very, it feels very stark of a contrast that I'm that like, I'm like, it's, it's the perfect stark contrast for me at least. Um, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I was very happy with that song. I mean, I, I was, I was blown away by the song. Cause again, like it's it, like for me, it, like it sounded like a simple song. Like you said, like the prog rock, just like, you know, the piano most of the way through whatnot. But mm-hmm. then like you're listening to the lyrics. I'm like, Holy fuck. What? What the mm-hmm. hell? Like I was yeah. absolutely fucking blown away by it. And especially like the, the softer part at the end that you had or whatnot, like fucking mm-hmm. like it, it hits like a goddamn freight train. Like Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like that, that was, uh, 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 Take a shot if you hear this word again. That was punctual, what you did right there, and you fucking like nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. I um the it's it's really interesting because that a lot of the facts that people know about Marion Zion check, those who knew about him prior to this song, um, I barely mention those facts in this song. Um it's like the whole he married a woman for a week, because uh, he won uh he married a woman in a week because he couldn't wait, uh, to uh the returning home announced his reelection. Like mm-hmm. all that section is essentially like just like a fourth of what there is on the Wikipedia page. And the rest of it was not even on the Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so like, you know, it was, it was like, it was, I think the hardest section to write was um, figuring out how to like that ending section really like was hard to write, not just because that, like I needed a way to have to conclude this story in a way that like made sense but i also remember uh vera who actually plays piano on that song right um uh she she had a hard time doing the tempo change because the vocals were already recorded and she just had to record over them but because it's like a slow down to a to a halt and then it goes back in she she couldn't do that section as as easily uh which was kind of on me but um so I just added the acapella, uh, like I did like an acapella arrangement for the outro and it ended up really working out. Um, so I'm very just, I'm uh, that, that song, I, I remember debating with whether or not I wanted to add that outro, um, with the, um, nature sounds mm-hmm. because I was like, is this too long? <laughs> but the more that I listened to the album in succession, the more I was like, it needs this space. Uh, it needs, it need, you need time to process what you just heard. Yes. Um, I think it's, I think it's one of the most verbose filled songs that I really have. And it was because of that, that I wanted to include the nature sound by the end. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm right there with you. Plus I, I just found it funny. Cause like you were debating about the nature sounds. If it'd make it too long, new, too long, right after you just had a 10 minute long song. I mean, <laughs> okay. Well, 10 minute long songs <laughs> after, after like, you know, like section after section, after section, after section changing is much different than just having like a minute 30 of just nature sound. Right. Right. You know, what? fair. It's, I'll, it's give you, I'll give you that. Different. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Um, <laughs> this is a, another song that I want to talk about really quickly. Fucking, I think you've said this before that this is at least your favorite to perform or whatnot, or at least just your favorite, one of your favorites on the album, but it's one of the ones that I have come to love the most, at least kudzu. I mean, (laughs) fucking 
I don't know if you remember this, but in the last interview, I told you about how in Safety First, like in the tail end of this song, I have this like ritual of just like, you know, smacking something for like the final like five or six beats or whatnot. Like, da, 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 da. Yeah. and then like the, the why did you promise to stay like right before that, like the, the drum beats beforehand with yeah. this one, with this one, I have a new ritual. Anytime the vocals come in that first uh, part or whatnot, I don't care where I am. I don't care if it's work or at, driving the car, whatnot. I am belting that first verse at the top of my lungs. All right. Is that, it greener where you are now section? Yes. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right. Just, just as soon as it comes on, is it greener where you are now? Do you need it to be green? It's, it was, I remember like, like really trying my damnedest to make sure that the performance, like was up to snuff. Cause I, I, I recorded a version Mm-hmm. before that just didn't hit as hard oh i literally that, that's what that's one of the few uh songs that i've re-recorded vocals specifically for i also added like all those harmonies that same day and um and the song came from two places uh the first place was um was my my girlfriend at the time had a dream that there was an album called could Zoo. Okay. I was like, well, what's good to? And then we started talking about it. And I was like, well, can I make a song like that? And uh, they were like, sure. Uh, the second thing was, um, was um, I had an idea for a song. So the intro, the, 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 like the, the, the do, 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 that mm-hmm. whole section. That's all. So what I did in order to make that sound was, so first of all, that's not a bass guitar. That is an that is um, that is an electric guitar pitched down an octave, um, to give it like this really like like kind of brassy tone almost to the bass, and then I put it through like a lossy filter. And then what I did was I recorded the timing of every single note afterwards separately, so I could pan it. So what happens is it goes from the center for the first note mm-hmm. to the immediate left and right sides to like a little closer to the center again. So it's really like, like it's really a subtle, um, it's really a subtle effect, but you, if you listen to it, it's very stereo. Yeah. Um, like it's, 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 it's subtle, but it's very stereo. Um, and so like, uh, like I remember having the idea to essentially like pitch up and down, like, like essentially plucking each string. Mm hmm. Um, and, um, and then pitching them as needed. And it took a while, but I finally replicated the idea that I had and, uh, uh, and it ended up being like, you know, my favorite fucking song of the album. And, um, and the beat switch, uh, from Kudzu where, where it goes to the next section. Yes. Somebody asked me what that represents at one point, and the reality of it is I literally just wanted the song to go somewhere else. I couldn't make a second verse that sounded like the first verse. I knew that for sure. <laughs> and the fact that, like, you know, the fact that the first verse is in a different perspective than the second verse, like a wildly different perspective, Yeah, I needed the uh, second verse onward to be a completely different vibe. And, you know, I remember... I essentially made most of the instrumental of the second part. And then, you know, the, the, the like orchestral intro that like goes into the first verse or into the first verse of the second half. Um, I remember being like, this needs something. And I was just like mumbling. And, was, and then eventually I was like, wait, this is the same flow that Willie uses on PF Tech Freestyle. I hit him up. And he gave me the uh, he gave me the acapella like almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, very very thankful that he allowed me to use that because I remember he actually didn't like uh, he he didn't like what I did for the came uh, uh, came from the dirt that's where we going back section. He didn't like the fact that I added in grew it from the ground so hell yeah you know I'm smoking that. He said that it was a little juvenile for the rest of the song, and I was like, no, that's perfect. That's what I want. Yeah. That's this is literally like my exact fucking like like you just like solidified that I need to use this even more. Like that completely backfired on your end. But luckily, <laughs> like Willie like understood that like like, you know, 
I needed to do what I needed to do with this song, and uh, he, you know, gave me his blessing and uh, and uh, let me let me release the song, and it's it's just a fucking juggernaut of a track. And, yes, and it's and it's like Willie played a huge part in that, and I I cannot I cannot thank him enough. Absolutely, I was gonna say if nothing else, like it is a fucking powerful track just like all the different effects that you've had into it and all the different you know beats and stuff mm-hmm. that were alongside it i know like whenever you were t- talking about earlier with uh having that kind of clean but dirty beat or something like that this was mm-hmm. the track that came to mind whenever you said that because i feel like it perfectly punctuates that more than anything else mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um and i mean like I could go on for days about just like all the other tracks. I know what was it? It could be better. That's that's just a bop right there, just straight up. Yeah, <laughs> just and we, sh- we've already discussed that a little bit too. <laughs> we're just going track by track at this point, and then repeating the album. Yeah, I mean, am I are we wrong when it comes to just any stuff? Like it goes back to what I said like a little earlier on. This is a legitimately like amazing album. Just kind of like the journey you took, like your audience upon when you know with each and every mm-hmm. single beat every single track you know all the samples that you incorporate or something like that like stepping back now especially now that it's been a year since you you know it's been out there to the world or whatnot are you amazed more or less like the fact that you're able to produce such a journey for everyone hmm. i um i it's funny that you say that because i feel like i always knew i was capable but i never knew i would be capable this fast okay um i i like I've always had a lot of ambitious projects in mind, um, like in the works since I was in high school. There are two albums that I wrote in high school that are still not released um, that I want to eventually re-record and release. But you know, there's a Bjork sample in one. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to clear that. There's two Bjork samples actually Ooh, in the same okay. song. Uh, <laughs> And um, hopefully I'll fucking be able to clear them. But you know, hopefully we can at least get one. I mean, I'm hopefully B- Bjork would be generous. But <laughs> yeah. uh, here's fingers crossed, baby. Uh, but um, but yeah, I'm a. Uh, I, I I I have a lot to go. For, like I have a lot to do uh, from this point on. I mean, like with uh, the shit that I'm working on right now, like you are not alone enough in the other album, uh, mm-hmm. which you know I haven't said the title yet for on purpose i really think that like i think you are not i think you are not alone enough takes you on a similar journey that tiafa does Mm -hmm. i also think that the album immediately after that takes you on perhaps a journey that i've never taken my audience on before and so so i'm really interested to see what people's reactions are to these two albums okay um and TSLV3, I mean, needless to say, um, like, you know, I, I feel like that concludes uh, a long, a long journey that has so far been, what, four years? Something along um, the lines of that, right? <laughs> yeah. It was released uh, November 2018. So, right. yeah, four yeah. years. Um, absolutely insane to me. But, yeah, like, <laughs> I, I'm just like... I'm just really happy that like um, I'm able to uh, actually make these journeys happen. I'm glad that I know how to drive now. (laughs) I mean, if nothing else, you've certainly been, you know, getting good reins at the wheel and certainly taking us on quite a trip to say the very least. Um, (laughs) um, Like it it also certainly doesn't help that you brought on like a lot of amazing collaborators like throughout this trip. Like something I kind of talked about last time we talked, but it's like you know there there's a lot of incredible people that you've been able to not only like bring along with you and like help you out with this stuff, but like really show a a spotlight to and really like give people an opportunity to really showcase who they are. Um, like off the top of my head, like the the three I can think about. Um, obviously like you know Holiday Kiss, you know Robin, you know whenever like when the music that they did produce or whatnot like was absolutely outstanding i'm glad you helped them with that opportunity very much Mm -hmm. like i know you at least for me like introduced me to what she was doing and Mm -hmm. i and i have not looked back since i'm so grateful and i anticipate every new like very much track that she drops um the newest one that i wanted to talk about that i fucking love um 
Gap Tooth Vamps. Um, I Gap Tooth Vamp. Yes. Yes. Um, because I because I'm a part of your Patreon. First of all, so for those that are wondering if you want to hear some incredible behind the scenes stuff, go. You know, Nat has a Patreon. Left at London. Uh, definitely worth you know even the single dollar just to support her. But um, I was able to listen to to Bright Ideas with Gap Tooth Vamp, especially after I remember like didn't they initially get like some backlash for the song for a song that they produced or whatnot? Yeah. Uh, that was actually how I discovered them was because that they like, uh, there was a song of theirs that got on my for you page and just like all the comments were negative. I was like, why this song sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and so I just like, you know, uh, like I made, uh, I stitched that video on TikTok and I was just like talking about like how, uh, how like, you know, it's, it's fucked up that people are doing that and how the song is really good. And I want to support the hell out of this person. So I like, you know, offer like, I offered them like, you know, I've got a bunch of friends in the hyper pop scene. I want to help you out, you know, stuff like this, stuff like that. And uh, eventually I was like, you know, I've actually got a song that I think that you would fit really well on. And um, I, I, I had bright ideas, um, which is one of the tracks that's going to go on this uh, third LP. Okay. Um, yeah um like hey kitty <laughs> um he just like backed the window because uh, <laughs> it was like a fly on the other side ah um, i gotcha but um you know after that um after that collaboration um like a after i made that track um i i had been looking for a guest verse on it for a while and then when i finally came across gap tooth vamp i was like this makes sense to me i this makes absolute sense to me yeah and um the final product that we came up with um really really um really felt important uh to the song and it really was important to me to hear the song uh in its finished product yeah. um I was, I was very happy to to uh I was very happy to be able to, um, you know, give a give a spotlight to an artist that you know hadn't been treated fairly thus far, and um, that's just all I can hope to do. It really is just like give spotlights to other artists. I mean, if nothing else, like especially if, like especially with Gap Tooth, like you know, for that song that you at least heard or whatnot, that was more or less like their first like step towards this career or whatnot like first step to really yeah. like going forth and really creatively like expressing themselves or whatnot and i think that like you like not only defending them but like going forth and like collaborating with them as well like i thought it was incredible and the final product i must say i fucking love it like a lot <laughs> bright ideas fucking slaps like i'll get out um but like you know going back to what you're saying like you want to be able to to provide like these artists like the spotlight that you think they deserve more or less because i mean i think you can attest to me there's a lot of incredible people out there and i appreciate the fact that you're able to give them an opportunity to really showcase like who they are like it, it, it mm -hmm. it's incredible that you've been able to be a part of that and like i can only imagine how it is for you like seeing this kind of stuff and realizing i have an opportunity to help them mm -hmm. <sighs> <sighs> i i really um I'm really grateful that I'm able to collaborate with the people that I'm able to collaborate with. Um, I always, uh, I always see it as fate, you know, when, whenever I'm able to get with an artist that like really respects what I do and really wants to be involved in what I do. And I in turn want to be involved, you know, with, with um, their vision for, you know, their verse on my projects and whatnot. Um, and, and, and so just being able to like, you know, collaborate like, like, like these, um, like, like for example, um, so TYGKO and Cookie are two artists that are on, uh, TSLV3. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because I was talking with, uh, I was talking with more Kismet, uh, cause our albums come out on the same day, the 24th. Okay. okay. Um, I was talking with them about like, yo, don't like are your singles with cookie and tygko also on your album and they were like yeah and i was like okay so we are the second and third projects of 2022 that have um 
that have tygko and cookie <laughs> on two of the tracks because because willie's project had uh had cookie on problem and tygko on uh drive it like you stole it okay and now and now um now both me and more kismet are like releasing uh like projects with these same two artists and it's really funny to me because not only like not only like is that just like I feel like that's just sort of like a, a, a byproduct of like, you know, everybody in the scene helping each other out. But I also just feel like, you know, I feel like this is like more TYGKOs and, and, and cookies year than it is like arguably any of ours. <laughs> uh, and um, I think it's just very, very, very pleasant that like, you know, all of us were able to uh, gather features by all these people. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know if you had more to say or whatnot. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I was gonna say now all that's left at this point is since you got you know, t- uh, since you got basically both of them on all these different albums or whatnot, we just need them to get together, kind of like a Silk Sonic, you you know, uh, meet up or something like that, and just come out with a joint project together, and it'll be just totally their year. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because that I literally actually am like pitching a song, like an instrumental. For both of them to like be on Ooh. and uh, like together, and uh, so far so good, you know. Like uh, we have we, we we that reminds me, I gotta I gotta reopen that project. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it certainly wouldn't yeah. hurt. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, but yeah. There you go. Well, I mean, we've kind of danced around a little bit, but I think it's time that we have to talk about, obviously, your upcoming EP that is obviously coming out very, very soon or whatnot, Transgender Street Legend Volume 3. Um, I kind of asked this last time as well, but I feel like... No, wait. I remember the last time you were talking about, like, this was... Back, keep in mind, this was... What was it October 2020 whenever we last talked or something like that like, yeah. the plans for a Volume 3 had always been there or whatnot. From mm-hmm. then you know 2020 or whatnot to where you are now how, how much has the the ep kind of changed and whatnot is it still like kind of this emotional like hit you like a freight train i should get my box of tissues ready like you know five track list last we talked i believe that four out of the five tracks were already finished okay uh well i just been sitting on them okay okay and um and i finally was like why haven't i finished this ep and so I just finished it and now it's releasing and hopefully people will like it. Like it's <laughs> like, I have to, I have to say that it wasn't the time for the, for that to be released, which is why like, you know, it, it wasn't released in October of 2020. I wanted to wait longer and sit on it and really think about like what I wanted it to sound like. And mm-hmm. the mixes ended up sounding way better because that I sat on it. Right. Like, um, I literally was just sitting around bored and I was like, wait a second. I never finished volume three. And then I just started mixing. And like literally that night I had basically finished it. And um, that was when I was like really starting to get antsy to like, you know, release it. I had to, uh, I, 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 I premiered the project to patrons on, on, on my, uh, on my fan discord. Mm hmm. I um I didn't even have the cover shot at that point. Um but you know, a week later I shot the cover. Yep. And um and uh I wanted to specifically do it in uh like my old house, so I so I literally contacted my roommate who's still my my ex roommate who still lived there. I was like, Hey, can we do the shot at your place? And uh they were like, Yeah, sure. Um because the sink in that specific apartment looks really weird. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that it looks, it, it looks almost like industrial. Like you spec on like a Navy ship or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It's uncomfortably like miscolored. Yeah. It's, um, and, and I knew that it would be perfect for the cover. Uh, so I really, I really like, I remember I, 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 um, I brought out this old camera of mine. Mm-hmm. I, I took a couple shots with that until the battery ran out. And then I was like, okay, fuck it. We're going to use my iPhone. And then I think one of the iPhone shots was one of the ones that got picked. Um, yep. Yeah. I was gonna say, if nothing else, I just at least appreciate that you kept the through line of the knife with all three of the volumes or whatnot, as a very much appreciated. Uh, that was always the plan. That, oh, was, that was the plan from volume okay. one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I. Well, it's nice to know that you went through with it all the way. Um, I was, yeah. I was gonna say, in fact, I, 
a little little aside, I'll probably cut this tiny little bit out. Um, I've already contacted an artist to do the thumbnail for this video, kind of like last one or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is having a through line with the knife. So if you remember the last thumbnail, I had the knife on the table. This time, I'm yeah. just telling the person, yeah, just put the knife in my back. I'll just be dead on the table or whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be gonna great. going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Anyways, going back to the interview. No, it's, it's incredible knowing more or less, like, you know, it's, it's great that you were able to finally, like, finish this product to fruition, really get it out there to mm-hmm. what it is to be. Um, and again, for those who may not be, you know, not know what to expect. I mean, we've already kind of talked about probably one of the hardest hitting tracks, which is going to be, uh, make you proud the, with, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, for those who, for some reason may have not have ever heard of one of your songs beforehand, or at least heard a transgender street legend EP beforehand, what should they expect from this, you know, five song track list? It is, it is primarily soul inspired, uh, like funk and soul inspired. Okay. And the last track, the last track ties the entire trilogy together. I feel like, or at least sonically, I feel like it's the perfect way to end the uh, trilogy. Um, I think that um, I think it's one of my most um, I think it's one of my most exciting releases. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's one of my funnest releases. Good. Um, and uh, I think people are going to like it. But, you know, only time will tell. Only time will tell. But, you know, again, based on the, at least for me personally, based on your track record alone of what you've been able to produce, it, it's going to be a fucking hit. It, there's there's no doubt in my mind based on that. Um, <laughs> I I know you said it's going to be like the most fun. And again, we, we talked about Make You Proud or whatnot. Would you also say that potentially this project may be your most personal one that you've presented out there i know you you're a very personal person with it's got my most personal songs uh but it's like i feel like the first two um the first two songs specifically are like like it's kind of like bloodlust where i was like writing in somebody else's perspective okay um those two songs were definitely written in the perspective of somebody else and um and i think that that's why it's like really fun to me this project okay uh because that like you know because it has uh those um those like shifts in perspective in fact bloodlust was going to be a transgender street legend volume three track and then i just decided against it okay fair enough didn't make sense to me yeah i mean it was good that you at least got it out there nevertheless i still fucking rocks yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um no nah, but like it's it's incredible more or less like the the fact that you're you're presenting the incredible stuff out there to the world. Like I, every single release, I've already said this a million times over, but I get excited every single time you release something new, whether it be like through Patreon, just in general or whatnot. Like I get excited every single time and hearing that, you know, not only do you have this coming out very soon, you have, you are not alone enough in development. You got a mysterious third album in development or whatnot. I, I have to ask like for the fans, like what should they expect from you at least short or long term? For the element of surprise, expect nothing. Okay, can do. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that makes the that makes it when you receive something a lot more fun. <laughs> or it could just be like that that one scene from Malcolm in the Middle. I expected nothing, and yet you still disappointed me. Um. <laughs> no, I I'm gonna at least have my base level expectations of it's gonna be good music no matter what. I'm not I'm not you know. I, I know what to expect from a left at London project. So there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we've been talking a lot about your albums and your music and stuff like that. I, I want to ask, like thinking back of just like your journey as a whole, like throughout this, you know, music creation and content creation in general and whatnot. Is there, can you think of like at least your most surreal or like the most surprising moment you've kind of had so far, like being able to be a part of this and being able to produce the stuff you've been able to? No. No? Okay. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I, I tried my damnedest. <laughs> you know, that's that's fair. I mean, it's one of those, like, I, you can also, like, correct me whenever I say this. I imagine this whole entire experience has just been more or less surreal for you in the first place. The fact that you've been able to have such a thing. Yeah, when life is surreal, surreal, like, when life is surreal, surrealism feels like reality. And reality feels like surrealism. 
So, mm-hmm. like, I'd probably, like, say something like, oh, yeah, I went to IHOP the other day. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. These times? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely a weird experience. Um, these dark times? <laughs> these, these morbid times? <laughs> We're happy. These unprecedented times. <laughs> these unprecedented times. Okay. That's fair enough. Well, yeah. once again, we've been talking a lot about just, like, your music and what you've been able to produce and what is to come. But for this next question, I want to ask more or less the dream scenario, if I may. I want to give you, look, let's say I am big shot Mr. Moneybags. I come up to him like, look, Nat, we know you can produce some outstanding stuff and we want to really give you the opportunity to produce stuff beyond your wildest dreams, more or less. We have access to anyone and everyone in the industry and more money than there should be possible. We could potentially be helping with so many different, like, you know, retreats or so many things to help people, but we'll get to that eventually. Right now we're focused on you. Yes. Yes. (laughs) If given this opportunity, what would be the dream left at London project? Probably I've been wanting to make a, like a fully like analog Baroque pop project. Mm. I've been wanting to do that for a while. I got a friend who's, uh, who's into analog stuff, but I also want to include like, you know, like, like an orchestra in this project. Like (laughs) if I can get an orchestra, and not just like, you know, MIDI strings. If I don't have to use contact, I'll, I will consider myself lucky. Okay. Um, like that's, that's the ideal goal. That's the ideal goal right there. All right. Just hey. to make a analog project. Okay. That's, that's ambitious more than anything else. Cause I don't think I've ever really heard of that kind of pop. Or if I have, I don't, I can't think of that top of my head, but that's something I'd just be like interested more than anything else. You got to send me some stuff to know what I, I got to get myself into. Hey, sorry to pop in here super quickly, but I wanted to give you this heads up before we finish off the podcast. So around this time, my brother had an alarm with his Amazon Alexa. He was not here to turn off that alarm. So for the final 10, 12 minutes, I'm sorry to say this, but you might faintly hear in the background an Amazon Alexa going off. There's nothing I can do to control it. I didn't know it was going off when it was happening. And there's not really much I can do to edit it out. So I apologize, but sincerely with the conversation that we had for this last little bit, I think it won't be too distracting, hopefully. Uh, enjoy the rest of the episode. Like God only knows. By okay. the Beach Boys. That's a broke okay. Pop song. Okay. Sergeant okay. Pepper. That's a broke pop album. Okay, got you. Okay, uh, now I'm getting the, the whole idea. San Francisco '60s, like, like that stuff, like anything with uh, harpsichord and guitars, were okay. essentially, yeah. Now that you describe it, okay, I know what you're getting at. I get the visualization and hearing how you produce music and stuff like that. I'd love to see that. Seriously, like knowing yeah. knowing what kind of unique flair you can add to it. Yeah, here's hoping. Here's hoping. I mean, if nothing else, maybe, you know, you've been able to get do so much so far. Who knows how far you can carry yourself at this point, right? <laughs> Fingies crossed. Fingies crossed. But with that, sadly, we got to come down from the dream scenario and we got to get back to reality. And I'll ask the ever so generic question, which I got an interesting answer last time I asked this. Where do you hope to see yourself five to ten years from now? Over there. Over there. Okay. I want to be over there. You know what? You have that goal in mind, and I hope you get over there at some point. Thank you. <laughs> I remember last time I asked that question, you said you just wanted to be, I think it was like just, just kicking back, eating mac and cheese, and just enjoying life. I think that's what you said last time. <laughs> so far, so good. I yeah. mean, like, <laughs> like – I'm, I, I've been eating mac and cheese pretty consistently. <laughs> I was going to say two years in, I would hope you would at least have enjoyed it at least once, you know, or a year and a half since we last talked. I'd hope you would enjoy it at least once. So, yeah, <laughs> there you go. But as we start to wind down the conversation, I just have one last question that I want to ask. Obviously, like you've deeply entrenched yourself when it comes to art and music, you know, all that stuff. Like it's been a part of you for as long as for, like I said, at least sixth grade, maybe obviously earlier than that. I can only imagine the the influence and such. How important is art, not just for you, but for the world as a whole? Um, I don't know. Probably not that important. Right. (laughs) That is what it is. This this whole thing is just fucking bluff. This is like, 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 what's the point, man? You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> is this another one of those factual inaccuracies that you were trying to point out? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm waiting for the comments now. I'm waiting for the comments. <laughs> Hey, you know what? You're getting me interaction on this video. I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> you, you stir up some controversy. It's, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Eminem way. It's the Eminem way. And in fact, I, okay, full disclosure. I think that's the reason that people see Eminem as corny as opposed to edgy nowadays. It's because that everybody expects what he's about to do. Yeah. Like, I, think, I think if he went like full like Chris Angel mind freak for this next era, I think people would be like, okay, now we don't know what's going to happen with Eminem. But now, like... Eminem can say like whatever he wants to mm -hmm. and still be regarded as corny because that we all expect it. He said more edgy stuff in the nineties. Well, I was going to say like, like, if you think back of like the nineties or whatnot, when he was first on the scene, no one knew what to expect in the first place. And that's why the stuff was like controversial in the first place. Cause no one knew what to expect in the first place. But now that we've yeah. had time and you know, people changing or whatnot, things happening in his life or whatnot to where he's kind of changed or whatnot, we know what to expect. So what may have been edgy then is just corny for us now. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I mean, I can still listen to like my name is and be like, you know what? Like this was a good ass song. Yeah. Like, I still, I will still, I, I still defend the fuck out of that song because it's like yeah. I know Eminem doesn't need defending. I know that Eminem does not deserve defending. <laughs> but that song by itself, right? Oh my! Finding out your mom got more pussy than you did. Yes. <laughs> Come on. Like, if, if not, like, it was the perfect introduction song for an artist, like, ever more than anything else. That was the first time anyone yeah. really knew about Eminem. That was, like, yeah. that is your way of just, like, fucking walking in through the door, busting a glass bottle, drinking whatever was left in that bottle, and just saying, I'm here, motherfuckers, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Starting starting off a song with, hi, kids, do you like Primus? is such a baller fucking move. Dude, it totally fucking is. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very new core of them. <laughs> I see what you did there. Um, Thank you. Um, but that's all the questions that I have for you, Nat. Um, I've already showered you with a whole bunch of praise, but I'm going to show you with a little bit more because it's my podcast. I do what the fuck I want. Um, no, criticize me. Oh, say criticize me. Say one bad thing about me. Uh, you don't push out enough music enough that they... <laughs> hey, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> That ever since I had first heard of you in the first place, uh, like truly get to like recognize you as an artist, as a musician or whatnot, which I think I told you this last time was whenever you were doing the Tyler, the creator, um, like ha how to make a Tyler song, uh, that little mm -hmm. meme that you did whenever, ever since I first heard of you from there and got to deep dive into your music, your music has truly impacted me. It's been incredible how you've been able to translate what you have so fluidly and so like y how unique of an approach you've taken to content creation to music and to just everything that you do i i am not joking when i say you were someone that i look up to and i admire when it comes to how i want to push out how i want to go about myself and how i want to push out the stuff i want to because at the end of the day i just want to push out the stuff that i love and the stuff that I love is having conversations like this with you. It has been an honor to even get to know you in the first place. It's been an honor to get to talk to you, not just once, but twice now. Um, and, like, I, the fact that I know that the there are amazing individuals like yourself creating some of the most unique and really, like, uh, connect – most grounded songs I've ever heard. And, like, mm. music that I can truly, like, relate to, like, on a whole different level or whatnot, it makes me truly appreciate you more than I ever did before. Um, I eagerly await anything that you push out, and I know that whatever you're going to be doing next is going to be fantastic one way or another. So, the long and short of it is, thank you for what you do, and thank you for just being yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the kind words, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, be here to hear them. Well, I, I don't know how to respond. To <laughs> Honestly, the thank you alone is more than I was anticipating. So thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but I don't have to do anything else. There you go. <laughs> well, I am going to ask you to do one last little thing, though. Um, okay. For those who may not already know, go ahead and plug yourself for the people at home. You really think that after a two-hour interview, 
somebody is going to listen to this entire two hour interview and not know a single thing about me or where to get anything of mine. <laughs> I, I I'm asking you this genuinely. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, I would like to hope that they had already, like, clicked on the links, like, way beforehand, and these are just people coming to love and appreciate you. Or, if nothing else, this is their first time listening to you, especially whenever we went, like, in-depth with, you know, Tiafa or something like that. I figured they would have clicked at some point, but you never know. At some know. point. You never know. All right, know. okay. You want me to plug something? I'll tell you what I'm going to plug. Go for I'm it. Not gonna plug, I'm not going to plug my own music. I'm going to plug the song of the summer, uh, which is um, Mark Morrison's Return of the Mac. Um, I think brilliant song. I think that we should all listen to it again. It deserves a second listen if you have only listened to it once, and it deserves a first listen if you've never listened to it before. Uh, my music is not as good as this. Uh, I I cannot beat Return of the Mac if I tried, <laughs> and I have tried. Um, so I I think that's what I'm going to plug today. Just Return of the Mac. <laughs> You watch, you like say it's like the song of the summer, but someone's gonna be like, Oh, it actually came out in like February of 1990. <laughs> oh my god, now I gotta look up what month it came out. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so this is the this is the song of this is the song of the spring. <laughs> the song of the spring. What it came out in like March or April or something like that. It came out March fourth, okay. nineteen ninety six. I I was off by a month. Okay, I can I can deal with that. <laughs> this song is four months older than I am. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Fucked up. Wait, when did you say? What year did you say come out? Uh, nineteen ninety six. Nineteen ninety six. Good lord, that's that song is two months older than me because I was born May ninety six. Hmm. Huh? Let's see what. <laughs> they're, they're like oh it was used in a it was used in a burger king commercial for their new menu item yeah, mac I, and cheetos yes i i i sadly remembered that that ad campaign very vividly because all they really did was it was return of the mac and cheeto that's all they really did with it they just added a and cheeto <laughs> to the end of it oh god <laughs> andrew yang used it as this campaign anthem that does not surprise me honestly Oh, that sucks. <laughs> I, that just straight up he, sucks. He's probably not the first person to use that for a campaign or something like that. According to Wikipedia, he is. Uh, but there you but, go. Uh, actually, actually, uh, Dukakis used it. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're wondering where you can hear Return of the Mac, I'll be sure to have it linked in the description below after... <laughs> After all of Nat's links, obviously. No, you put that shit at the top. You put that shit at the top. Okay, okay, I'll put it at the top. Before there's before there's any fucking introduction, before there's any description, there's just a singular link for the Return of the Mac music video. Return of the Mac music. Okay, fine. You you've you've persuaded me. I'll do that. Uh, Thank you. Do you have any final words before we sign off? Um. My secret gold is buried in... Thank you for sticking around to the end, especially after a long episode like this one. <laughs> if this is your first time listening, I greatly appreciate you sticking around to the end, and I sincerely hope you enjoyed. If you're returning, uh, hopefully you know how big of an episode this is for me. I've talked about Nat Left at London several times before on this podcast. Um, talked with several artists and stuff that have been influenced by her. It just... The way that she carries herself is something that I truly, like, aspire for. Something that inspires me when it comes to pushing out the content that I love and creating the stuff that I want to. Because I know 
that when it comes to when it comes to Nat, I I just admire the fact that like in the conversation you heard her talking about how like if things are sounding a certain way or whatnot, like she'll lean into it instead of going with whatever everyone else wants. Like she's truly pushing out the stuff that she loves. And that's the thing that I absolutely love and admire about her. That and her music is fucking phenomenal. She is the artist that I aspire to look for when it comes to people being artists or whatnot. She she does a great job of what she does and she puts a lot of love and passion to every little bit that she does. She puts her heart soul, emotion, like everything into every little piece that she does. And you can see it with just about every little bit that she does. I I just, I, I feel lucky to even get to talk to her, not just once, but twice at this point. And I know that she's got incredible stuff coming her way. I I feel like there should be some good stuff coming her way more than anything else. With how much she's put into it and how much she has supported everyone else doing this shit, I mean, it's only a matter of time. I believe in you, Nat. You got this. You got this. And again, you probably don't even need me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the last little bit I want to say when it comes to this week's episode is... You know, times, times are really tough for people. Times are tough for everyone. Um, but just always keep yourself in mind with whatever you do, whether it be art or not. You know? Keep yourself in mind. Make sure you take care of yourself and go easy on yourself and show a lot of love and support for yourself. Because while there is a lot of people that probably would be willing to give you a lot of love and support, it starts with you more than anything else. You guys are all absolutely incredible people, and you deserve all the love in the world. And that needs to start with yourself. Like I said, more than anything else, make sure you go easy on yourself. Especially how rough everything is out there. Like, take it easy. Don't don't push yourself thin. Don't wear yourself out. You're doing a great job with what you've been doing. And again, I know it's hard sometimes. I know it's rough sometimes to try to keep a positive mentality and try to, to keep yourself moving forward. But it, it's worth it. It'll be worth it. I promise you that. All right. Promise me you'll go easy on yourself. Promise me you'll showcase that you'll love yourself. Good. Have a good day, all right?